When I asked Jonathan Hickman at 2020 C2E2 about writing X-Men Empire tie-ins, he seemed uniquely excited about the storytelling chances the mega event afforded him, and now we can see why in the deliriously fun Empire X-Men number one. Today I'll answer, how does X-Men tie into Marvel's Empire event going on right now? What role does Scarlet Witch play in the story, and what does her presence mean for mutant resurrections? And what is X-Corps, and why does it matter? We'll talk a little bit about the history of the organization and its recurrence here in the pages of this Empire event tie-in with X-Men number one. You're listening to Kraken Krakoa number 62. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald. If you like the CBH YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. You can find full reading orders for X-Men and comic books over on Comic Book Herald. Spoilers for Discuss Comics, including the Empire event, may follow. Creative credits here belong to Jonathan Hickman, Teeny Howard, Matteo Bafagni, Nolan Woodard, Clayton Cowles, and Tom Muller. The issue opens unexpectedly with Doctor Strange addressing Wanda Maximoff, a.k.a. the Scarlet Witch, a.k.a. Mutant Kind's Great Pretender, since House of X and Powers 10, responsible for the depowering of approximately 1 million mutants on Marvel's M-Day. That Doctor Strange opening feels so much like Hickman jumping back into New Avengers territory, Doctor Strange of course being part of the New Avengers Illuminati. Thematically, too, I think we're seeing Wanda utilized very similarly to how Hickman used Doctor Strange in New Avengers, sinking lower and lower into the depths of mystical solutions that only cost more of his soul. We're seeing a little bit of that here, except this time with Wanda Maximoff. Wanda spends close to a year looking to redeem herself by resurrecting the mutants of Genosha, which again, historically, is not her fault. Wanda, yes, caused the decimation of mutant kind after the House of M event, which is Marvel's event in 2005, by saying no more mutants, right? And a million mutants were depowered. All sorts of problems arise that are only now sort of being corrected by Krakoa and some of the protocols they have there. Genosha, though, and the 16 million mutants dead is the fault of Cassandra Nova, Professor Xavier's evil twin. There's a quote here I found really interesting. Your powers over reality make you a touchstone of the reality in which they exist. Doctor Strange says this to Wanda Maximoff. So here's the question. Is Wanda's No More Mutants a recurring threat across Myra's lifelines? Was this an unanticipated anomaly in the plan? And if so, why did Myra, Professor X, and Magneto let it happen, right? Did the depowering of mutant kind have to happen to get us to where we are now in the Dawn of X? This being an Empire event tie-in, I do think it's important here. We see Wanda go to Genosha, try to resurrect all these mutants. Something goes terribly wrong. And now here we are with an Empire crossover. This event, written, co-written by Al Ewing and Dan Slott with art by Valerio Shidi, colors by the X-Men's own Marty Gracia, is uh, basically all about the Kree and the Skrull unite. They form an alliance, and they are determining that the main threat to the universe is now the Kotati. Now, there's a long history here with the Kotati that I won't go into all of. You can check out my Road to Empire event for more on that. But essentially, they are a plant-based species in the Marvel Universe that has been uh, historically sort of um, uh, uh, mistreated by both the Kree and Skrull. Mistreated being a very, very polite way of saying uh, massacred and nearly, uh, you know, committed genocide against them, right? So the Katadi are sort of, they're fighting back, right? And this is their grand plan to get revenge. They now consider themselves a sort of avengers, right, against the atrocities that were committed against the Katadi. So following the events of Empire Number 1 and Number 2, the Katadi invade Earth and Genosha specifically as a staging area for a Wakandan invasion. Hickman gets to have a lot of fun with the Katadi invasion here. You know, quotes like, they are meat, Captain. Never mythologize the meat. And what happens is these Katadi plant alien folks land on Genosha, and they meet now Wanda's resurrected alien, not alien, zombie army of mutants that she tried to bring back to life to bring those 16 million mutants back on Genosha, except instead she wound up with zombies, including, of course, Explody Boy, who we all know and love. Which all leads to an all-out side war during the Katadi's raising of Earth. Wanda, again, she's back on her BS. Jonathan Hickman definitely has it out for Wanda Maximoff. The absolute tragedy of Wanda here is she clearly doesn't know resurrection protocols exist, right? She's not privy to what's happening on Krakoa not being a mutant herself anymore, right? <laughs> so she's doing all this Herculean mystical energy gathering only to get a massive spell wrong for nothing. This raises the question, too, if Wanda's resurrection could overlap with Krakoan resurrection, right? Genosian mutants, are, are could they already have been brought back and she's bringing them back in her own measure? Could that be part of the reason they turned into zombies? There was an interesting conundrum raised in Hellions number 2 about resurrecting clones of clones. And Wanda's machinations certainly seem to fit that bill, right? Can these Genosian zombies now be resurrected, existing in their zombie state? 
The second part of the Empire tie-in follows uh, Warren Worthington and Monet. They're setting up a new x Corps. Magic shows up to tell them that Professor X wants to make sure their work is not redundant with his existing portfolio of riches, which is quite uh, plentiful. Monet gets a hilarious line here. Look at all these old men that they're dealing with. Warren could take them. x Corps is a concept that debuted during Morrison's time on New X-Men in the annual number one and was essentially an international organization providing safe haven for mutants everywhere, since the X-Men couldn't be everywhere all the time. It's a lot like a later Morrison idea, Batman Incorporated, but more tangentially a part of the new X-Men narrative. As far as I'm aware, X-Core has been shut down since House of M and Decimation, which means mid-2000s in real time. So yes, there is a need, or at least you know, in theory, to reestablish this organization in the, paid, in the Dawn of X. Meanwhile, the Katati invasion is leading to a sickness of Krakoan gates, and Black Tom Cassidy recognizes this, right? He is attuned to Krakoa and set of the plant life. His powers allow him to understand Krakoa, it seems, in a way that really only uh, Doug Ramsey is, is on, you know, is, is even approximate wavelength. I'll be curious to see, as these Empire Titans progress, just how much damage the Katati actually do to Krakoa and mutant kind's means of travel. Ironically, Krakoa itself might be one of the very few forms of life the Katati are content to let live, but the Krakoan gates remain this uh, extreme vulnerability, I think, for the X-Men, right? They just sort of plant them out in the open, let them be, and obviously there have been groups, one of which we're going to see here in a moment, where they can kind of have their way with this. Um, you know, it leads to problems. So within the story here, we have Warren, Monet, Magic, and Multiple Man. If Warren starts going by Mangel, that's a hell of a 4M alliteration party. Check out the disturbance on Genosha to uncover the Katati vs. Zombie Mutant War. This leads to some very fun and intense action, of course, for the issue um, as we bring this very small mutant party to check out what is going on on Genosha. And they find not only zombies, but this invasion of, you know, alien plant creatures and have to sort of prevent them from getting to the Krakone gates. Now, again, there's an interesting thing here where, in theory, the resurrected mutant zombies could maybe use the Krakoan gates because they have some form of mutant DNA, so they could invade Krakoa, or at least that is the, the fear. Lo and behold, Horde culture reemerges to keep the mutant zombies at bay, or so it appears. Since it's been a fair amount of time, some would say it could have been infinitely longer, Horde culture debuted in the Hickman and Lionel Francis U X-Men number 3. It remains the absolute wildest curveball of the Hickman era, although honestly, given that we have a major, majorly plant-focused event going on at Marvel, I'm glad to see there's a natural role for this strange group of octogenarians to fit. You know, I definitely questioned, like, okay, what is the actual plan here with this this creation of horde culture? And within Empire, you know, they kind of make sense. We got the plant-based Katati, we got Krakoan Gate problems. Sure, bring them back. Let's see what they got. I'm sure there will be more of them in issue number two. The Krakoan for the next issue reads, Next Zombie Hordes. Personally, I'm quite glad to see Empire used as a springboard for telling Scarlet Witch, x Corps, and Genosha stories. These are all some of the major historical touch points the Dawn of X has held up as sacred texts, so it's refreshing to see them expanded upon. One idea I'd really like to see explored is why Wanda's spell went so awry. Is she just bad at this, or is there something deeper, something she actually loathes about mutants? Remember, her paternal lineage is a mess, but for plenty of time she's thought Magneto was her dad, and that's coming through in her actions, potentially, right? Likewise, there has to be a Krakoa meets the Scarlet Witch situation or scene, and they have to assess her culpability in this latest monstrous act, however well-intentioned. She just turned the graves of 16 million of their own into a zombie army. Right? And and what is her role now? Did she just do that and bail? Like, where is Wanda in this action? Obviously, that has to be revealed as well. How much did or do Professor X, Magneto, the Council, etc. know about this? Is this going to be news to them? Uh, these are all really, I think, interesting questions, and I'm, I'm very excited to see them play out. So I think, too, like, if Scarlet Witch, okay, she does this thing that is, I have to think, going to infuriate a lot of mutant kind, could this easily be the fodder for the Avengers vs. X-Men 2 type event that gets teased so often. You know, I'd hope the House of Ideas gets a little more creative than that, but it's certainly not impossible to imagine that that could be very much a centerpiece or a center point of something that would bring these two sides to the brink. So again, I really dug Empire X-Men number one. I thought it was a lot of fun. I have not been super into uh, Empire number one and two. I think, again, like the theme and messaging of this comic is really messy, and I think it's been kind of boring as an event, but this X-Men comic stayed strong. Thanks to everybody over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald for supporting the site and supporting the YouTube channel and all sorts of things I do. In particular, I want to thank the mysterious benefactors tier listed 
here. You can find more of my stuff at comicbookherald.com. I'm Dave at Comic Book Herald, pretty much anywhere online. You can look for the best comics ever and my Marvelous Year podcast for more. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.